Chris Greer and Mike McDaniel meet at the owners' meeting today, and they got some things to talk about, so we're going to talk about it. What is up, Finn fans? If you haven't checked out earlier today's video, I kind of go in depth on how the whole Tyreek Hill trade put an unnecessary light on Tua Tagovailoa per Barry Jackson, reacting to his article and talking about some other things. So if you haven't yet, go check that out. Uh, but yeah, right now I'm going to talk about Mike McDaniel and Chris Greer meeting with the media. Now we're going to watch Chris Greer's video. Chris Greer's video is about... 12 minutes long. Mike McDaniel's video is a half hour plus long. So if you want to go watch that video, it is on their YouTube channel. I have the transcript here. So essentially, I'm going to run down and talk about a few things here and there. If things get redundant or things, get, you know, he repeats himself, then essentially uh, I'm going to paraphrase it and we'll move on. So we'll jump right into Mike McDaniel. The first thing they talk about is Teddy Bridgewater and how essentially he didn't answer the question about starting quarterback, da, 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 this, this, and that. And he essentially says, as an example of Teddy being a true professional and being experienced in the business, that's for us to talk about, really not him. Essentially meaning, it's not for Teddy Bridgewater to say, well, Mike McDaniel brought me in and said that he brought me in because he wants me to compete with Tua and eventually I'll take it. It's not for him to say. So he's being a true professional, keep it to himself. You guys uh, around the combine, I was describing specifically what I thought Tua really needed in support with a backup quarterback, unbeknownst to you guys. I was quite literally describing Teddy Bridgewater at the time, just not using his name. So both players have been explicitly, explicitly, geez, Doug, explain their roles and expectations and for that room to be their best. They know to know, uh, they need to know that and moving forward. We're very excited to have Teddy a part of the process and hope to win some games with both guys working together and empowering Tua to be the best player he can. That's something that Teddy took seriously and is excited to do. Essentially, in a nutshell, Teddy Bridgewater is the backup to Tua Tagovailoa. Tua Tagovailoa is the starter for the Miami Dolphins. Uh, and then, God forbid, Tua gets injured, then Teddy comes in. I don't see at any point Tua getting benched. Trying to think of a, a scenario where I could see Tua getting benched. Maybe, just maybe. No, no, like you could say, like, oh, it's the end of the season, and the Dolphins are in the playoff hunt, and Tua starts struggling. If that's the case, then they wouldn't be in the playoff hunt if Tua is struggling because he's been the quarterback the whole way. So no, I don't see a way um, for them to bench. So again, the only way to uh, Teddy Bridgewater seems to be starting again as of right now from Mike McDaniel's mouth is, um, yeah, if he got um, injured. So then they were asking your reaction when you heard Teddy Bridge, uh, Tyreek Hill had the, you know, they had the possibility of getting him. There's a lot of stuff going on in my brain. You're not sure if it's true. You get involved in these processes. There's a lot of things that come across your desk. So I was trying to be a pro and understand that you don't go ahead of yourself, but it's very exciting to go through the process to see really uh, Chris Greer uh, and Brandon Shore, who is the Senior Vice President of Football and Business Relationship work. And once it came to fruition, I couldn't be happier for the Dolphins adding a player of that talent. Yeah, it's flipping good. <laughs> um, on Toronto Armstead and plans at right tackle position. I know a lot of people are very interested in understanding what's happening at center and what's happening at the right tackle position and confidence in the in-house candidates. I am very confident about the players that we have on the offensive line position. I know Teron is going to be the left tackle for sure. There's your answer. But it wouldn't be fair to the process or the players to try uh, to outline exactly who's going to be where uh, moving forward. Only because when you just go off the top of my head, there are about four players, whether we got them in the draft in the last couple of years or in free agency this year, that one of their strengths is their versatility. Robert Hunt. And we're doing a new scheme that highlights different attributes of players' performance, and it wouldn't be fair to the process nor to the player to say, okay, this guy's going to be uh, here exactly at this point because it's a different scheme. We ask uh, people to do different things, but I'm excited about all of the play, uh, the, the players while re really each and uh, each and every draft pick that we've had up in front uh, with the with where guys that in a different city 
when I was working on a different team, we were looking at targets for ourselves. So essentially he's saying that like, he, the Dolphins drafted players that he was potentially looking at, at, at with the 49ers. So I'm excited about those player, uh, those types of players and starting in a week, we'll begin the process to decide exactly where they're at. So essentially he's saying he doesn't want to pinpoint certain players on this team because there's certain players on this team that are versatile. Like I said, Robert Hunt, there is a possibility, and he, it, it's a different scheme. So he doesn't want to say, okay, you played right guard, Robert Hunt, and you played this and you played that for Brian Flores and, you know, whoever else. So that's what you're going to play for us. Different scheme, different style of offense. So he doesn't want to say, you're going to be here now because you that's where you were. He's going to try him out and say, hey, actually, in our system, Hunt, you are a little bit better at right tackle. You're a little bit quicker, and you'll help us more at right tackle. We're going to put you at right tackle. And then say to Liam Eikenberg, you know, you're, you have shorter arms, but you do have some power behind your moves. We're going to put you at right guard and, you know, move things around there. So you never know. They asked him, what does he envision Tyreek Hill in this offense? I'm really excited about what Tyreek can do on the field. But even more than that, I think he has an opportunity that he's really excited about to develop the room as a player and a leader. There's a lot of youth on our team, and he has a lot of outstanding experience and really trying to uh, just start next week, get him in the door, have him learn our language, and then utilize his vast array of skill set in multi multitude of ways. But you got to start with the foundation, much like building a house. We're going to build a football team, and we've got to start with how to line up and what cadences are and how to come off the ball, utilizing every skill, single asset that he has in his body. So next week, from what he's saying, is they're going to start working on stuff and, and getting together. So I'm very interested to see how that all pans out. But I like that he talks about you know starting from the ground up, but also working together, helping each other. And I think that's why Teron Armstead came back. That's why they brought back Emmanuel Ogba, because he was really helping um, Philip Lindsay. Bringing back guys that can help others if they're not playing. And that's why I kept saying to you guys, Connor Williams and Teron Armstead, yes, People think it's a little hypocritical to say, oh, we need to address the offensive line, but we're okay with Tua. It's because they're going to help the guys. So I like that he keeps saying that. And if he feels the team has done enough yet to get greatness out of Tua, he says, well, I hope not because we haven't been able to meet about uh, football yet. So in regards to Tua and really any player on the offense, that the nuts and bolts really begin April 4th. Uh, for us when we start phase one you try to have good players on your team on both sides of the ball as well as special teams you try to empower players by having good teammates and then you just as boring as it is you have to deliberate uh, uh, deliberately engage day in and day out to really get the end results that everybody wants so have we done it yet we barely even scratch the surface. There is no shortcut to doing anything great in the league. As much as you'd like to say uh, to say bold this, that, or the other, there's no shortcut. There's no secret. It's it's guys coming together trying to work for a common goal and become the best offense. Which ha uh, which has remember football is eleven separate players working together in unison at the same time. That's what we're going to start uh, working on Monday. Each and every day, we're going to challenge Tua to be the very best, as well as each other player on the offense. And then they said, have you seen a lot of tape of last offseason? He said, absolutely. He's, a, he's, he, why wouldn't he see tape of last year? But yeah, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, Dolphins this and Dolphins that. A lot of people want to say, oh, look at the Chargers. Chargers are now the best team. And look at this team. They had all these players. They're the best team. And da, da, da. It don't matter until you get together and you start working together. So it don't really matter. Um, would you say that this year's offense will be better? That's kind of redundant because didn't he answer that when it came to the question before? He said, I can't say this year is going to be the best uh, that we can make into. There's a lot of people have to, and I'm just going to dust some magic potion and be like, you're the best. He laughs. No, you have to have a lot of people engage in one direction to maximize whether we have, uh, have maximize whatever we have and score the most points possible and be the best offense. So yeah, essentially he's saying again, I don't know. We got to work together and see how this all goes. If you guys didn't see, he kind of had a moment where he talked to Bill Belichick, kind of shook his hand um, and talked to him and they asked him about it, you know, on sharing a moment with Bill Belichick and his reputation. Because if you guys remember when Rex Ryan came and became the Jets head coach, 
he essentially was like, I'm not going to kiss the ring. and da, da, da. He says, I feel like I'm a couple of wins uh, behind him in the win-loss column. A couple. Um, <laughs> that's uh, uh, somebody that if you're a football guy and you have a pulse, I have the utmost respect and admiration for a coach of his caliber and one of the best ever, if not the best, to ever do it. Mike. Mike. Don Shula. Uh, as far as... Uh, as far as how I compared uh, with Wits, maybe ask him and he'll be complimentary for me. I don't know. He says, I think it's part of the business. It's okay to really respect people and acknowledge all the things they've done for the game of football. Acknowledge where it might be if he hadn't been there, you know. I think that's important, but also I'm a professional football coach for the Miami Dolphins and we're going to have to play them twice a year. There's some comp uh, competitiveness there that entertaining to say the least. I was happy to talk to him. He's a tremendous human being, football coach, and I'll be excited to go against him next year. Very PC, politically correct answer. Um, they're asking if Connor Williams will stay at left guard. He says, again, I know in his past, and I think Connor said he's been most comfortable at left guard with the Cowboys. What does that mean for the Dolphins? Again, it wouldn't. I wouldn't be doing justice to the process of all the players involved to not get them in house in trade. So essentially, he again he answered this question before when he said, "We'll see. It's a different system on different teams and uh, people doing different things. We're going to try out the best and see what we can do." Uh, he, they asked, "Can you describe your relationship with two at this point and how's it evolved?" He says, "That's been a cool process because uh, the first you talk to somebody since like maybe the combine process is on Facetime when you're flying on a jet to meet him." Since then, I think he's been a lot of uh, he's been a lot of trust that has been earned. We've both been very honest and candid with each other, and I think in any healthy relationship, that's paramount. There's been a fun process uh, building that. It's uh, a lot of build up, but you have to uh, you have to wait because the current CBA mandates we do, uh, that we do talk we don't talk football mandates that we do. I think they messed up this transcript. But once the process starts on April 4th, I think the uh, equity that we've built and trust and mutual respect, I think that will pay dividends coming to work Monday about this time. I think that this process is going to be different. Um, I'm hoping that Tua feels more comfortable in his situation and he feels more comfortable with his head coach because... You could tell he didn't feel comfortable with Brian Flores. Now, again, I talked about this in today's earlier video. To say that Brian Flores didn't want to draft Tua is just blatantly false. Uh, but to say that their relationship didn't sour or he didn't start to realize that maybe he doesn't like the quarterback he drafted, that's also true. I would say that would lean more towards the true side. Um, because you notice it, right? He, he got put in an offense that had nothing to do with him, nothing towards his strength. And then the final, following year, they kind of took away – potential good offensive line players and didn't really address the wide receiver position except for bringing in Waddle and no run game and then he had like it was just a whole mess and then the whole Deshaun Watson situation whereas now you have a guy from jump saying two is our guy and then putting the pieces around him and consistently being in contact with him and then uh when they asked him about trading for quarterback Tom Brady again he said Tom Brady Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Tom Brady, Super Bowl winner? No, there has been that has not been in the conversation at all. I think uh, what you can call fake news. So again, shot it down, instantly shot it down. So you know when it came to the whole Deshaun Watson situation, who's our quarterback? Who's our quarterback right now? I can't talk about play. Uh, da, da, da. He never shot it down. He never said no. I'm not trading for Deshaun Watson. Never did it. First chance to Mike McDaniel gets? No, we're not doing that. That's fake news. Get out of here. We, get out of here. Get out of my face. They asked him about retaining Mike Gazicki and Emmanuel Ogba. He says both players were very, very fortunate to retaining both players uh, on both sides of the ball just because when you're taking – uh, when you're talking about our professional football players, they know the process and how to execute and perform on a week-in, week-out basis. Those types of things cannot be lost in the whole process about uh, dependable playmakers. I feel like that's what the Dolph Miami Dolphins got in resigning both players. Yeah, especially the continuity and the familiarity with um, 
Tua and with Jalen Phillips and with the guys next to him and all that stuff. And the last thing I want to talk about from Mike McDaniel, again, there's more. So if you want, go check out their YouTube page. Uh, is there a new formula to win now? Because the Dolphins are doing it different. The Dolphins don't have a, a first pick until round three. I think I pick 106. Um, so they they are. it seems like they're in a win now mode or they feel like a lot of the talent that is coming out in the draft especially trying to get one at 29 and 50 they had a better opportunity at what they did and he says it's always been it's always kind of been the coaches whether you guys realize it or not are very aware of everyone's impatience including ownership fans and media our particular circumstance was that we have the least amount of players under contract in the national football league entering in free agency we were aggressive in what we did and excited about the players we were targeting. But we also had the, the, the most ground to make up in regards to our existing ro roster and having that prepared to go into the draft into next season. Um, so yeah, essentially he's saying why they did what they did is because they had pretty much the most amount of free age. I think it was like 20-something? potential free agents and they re-signed a bunch you know they brought in a bunch of potential free agents so i think it, they did a pretty good job on that aspect of it um and that, again that's where we came in saying um oh they're not that aggressive why aren't they being more aggressive blah 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 well they kind of were because they brought back a lot of their own players so that's what mike mcdaniel had to say i i really enjoy him being blunt and honest and straightforward, especially when it came to Teddy Bridgewater, when it came to the um, Tom Brady trade, when it came to who's playing what on the offensive line, he tells it like it is so far. So I'm really enjoying that. So let's now listen to uh, what Chris Greer had to say, uh, which I'm, I'm also interested in this because Chris Greer um, said he was going to be aggressive and we were like, you're not really aggressive. Wait a minute. So, let's see. Let's see what he had to say. The guy who's been known to love building through the draft, and now you're not picking until 102. One, is that going to be strange for you? And two, what was the thinking that that led to that? Well, I think the last time I was involved in that was uh, when we took. Uh, we didn't pick until the third round years ago when we took the McKinney from Texas A&M. <laughs> years ago and it was a pretty boring day one <laughs> you know but uh you know we had been building here for a while you know since we took over just trying to you know acquiring picks and you know cleaning up salary cap and stuff and so uh, i think it was the opportunity to to add a good player you know a very dynamic player it's one that we feel is one of the best players in the league and uh, when those opportunities come we just felt you know you can't pass on it and i think we had spent the last few years like i said building and, and and getting the roster to a point where we feel like we can start competing. And uh, at the end of the day, being able to add a player of his caliber, uh, we just felt it was too good to pass on. And and to do deals like that, you always need uh, good support from ownership from Steve, Tom, and then and then Brandon working and you know with the agent as well uh, to finish up the deal. When did you realize that was a reality to get a Tyreek Hill? <laughs> uh, I would say it was probably. Uh, we had first heard it was um, last Friday, I believe it was, or before the uh, the previous Friday, and um, we reached out and we were like, "There's no way we can do this," <laughs> you know. And then as we looked into it and talking it over with again Steve, Tom, Brandon, and we're like, you know, we can find a way to make this work. And so we looked in, and then you know, and, and obviously to make a deal like that, you have to. Um, Great partners, so Brett Beach and uh, Coach Reed were tremendous to dealing with over, um, it, was, it was about a five day period of trying to come together. And so uh, we were fortunate and uh, thank them for their patience as well. And and, uh, and we feel good about adding Tyreek. Chris, wanted to ask you about. That's funny because again, we were sitting here saying, where's the aggression, where's the aggression and what? So Wednesday started free agency, Thursday, and then Friday. So two days after the start of free agency, he was trying to make a move to get Tiger Kill for about a week, give or take. That's funny that we again. And some of you guys, I'll give you credit. Some of you guys on Twitter, some of you guys in the in the comment section. A lot of people were asking, "Where's the aggression?" And a lot of you guys were saying, "How do we know they're not being aggressive? How do we know behind the scenes they're not being aggressive?" And kudos to them. 
And kudos to whatever new system they have. Because if you guys remember, under Brian Flores, there was a lot of leaked information. Whereas we didn't hear about the Dolphins being interested in Tyreek Hill until the day of the trade, until an hour before the trade happened. So completely different now. I'm, I'm sorry, I have one quick thing. I'm going to ask you about inside linebacker and safety. A couple fans have asked me to ask you if you all are pursuing Tyron Matthew, if that's an option. And then the decision to come back with this inside linebacker group, you're, you're thinking on that with a Landon Duke, yeah. Jerome, obviously. Uh, no, we're not pursuing Tyron. Um, good player. Um, I think he'll be a, a good addition for any team in the league. But uh, no, we're not pursuing him. Uh, inside linebacker, you know, uh, a Landon is a leader on the team. Um, he's, he, he's, you know, we're still a young defense. And his presence and his communication skills and, you know, he and Josh, you know, are, are on the same page in, in terms of thinking about how running the defense. So um, that was a huge part of it. And then, uh, you know, Duke Riley had done a great job for us, um, you know, in his role competing for playing time and on special teams. And, and in terms of what he added on and off the field, he was a quality person, and, you know, and then uh, bringing Scarlett back as well. So they're all, you know, guys that are tough, competitive, smart, good kids. And uh, so um, we felt good about adding the group, bringing them back together. Shot down, Tyron Matthew. Um, I heard different from certain people that have sources. I heard different. I heard that they did have some type of contract uh, for him. Um that it was about whether he wanted to accept it or not. I heard rumors that uh, Sam Madison was trying to recruit him. I heard that um, they were trying to get him to kind of play that middle linebacker position because they already have Brandon Jones and Javon Holland playing the safety position. Uh, but I guess not. I guess he's shooting that down, saying, no, nope, they're not going after him, whether it be that they tried to. Again, he never said they didn't. He's saying, no, they're not. Could be that they tried to and then they couldn't come to an agreement. And I think Tyron probably wants more or play in a different position. So there's that. Um, and then when he comes to the middle linebacker, he said he's comfortable with Brent Scarlett, with Landon Roberts, um, Duke Riley. I'm not. I'm not. It's funny how my shift of concern for this team went from being wide receivers, offensive line. It's now linebackers. That's like number one on my list right now. So we'll see. We'll see if they address it. So you were building for several days with the Hill trade. And then ultimately it came down to, I don't know, a phone call or text or whatever. Take us through that minute when you found out, yeah, he's, he's ours. What was that like? Uh, I was at the Ohio State Pro Day, and I told Tyreek he was wasting my time here that I was watching these two receivers from Ohio State. So I go, I go, he owes Mr. Ross some my money since I paid for that flight and that hotel room overnight. But uh, very excited. Frank Smith was there with me. Um, you know, we, we kind of fist bumped, and then a bunch of coaches were around us, and you know, and they cursed and <laughs> were like, mm -hmm. but uh, congratulated congratulated us on the great move. And uh, so no, we were very happy, thrilled. Uh, very excited. Tyreek was very excited on the phone. We talked to him, and um, so again, we, we felt, you know, blessed that you know we had the opportunity to add him because he's such a tremendous player in person. Can you touch on the linemen that you added, Toronto Armstead, uh, Connor Williams, and the fits for them here? Yeah, you know, I, I think when we, you know, Mike has assembled a really good staff, and it's very heavy offensive line coach, you know, uh, coaches, um, and I think he's done. Um, a great job in terms of communicating that vision for what he wants. And so I think for us, you know, we feel good about the young players we have, as does Mike and the staff talk about them. You know, um, they understand they need to play better and, and can get better. But I think the scheme also is very friendly for offensive linemen. And I think Teron had mentioned that in his press conference and wanted to play in the scheme. And, and Connor Williams was a, another one that uh, we felt excited about because we think he's a very good run player. And is also he's very athletic and can pass block. And I think, um, like anything, they all keep working, improving, get better. And, and so we're very excited about the group overall. What, what's the thought process at center? Um... Very interesting things. One, uh, I like the joke that he said to uh, Tariq Hill, essentially being like, you're wasting my time I'm here at Ohio State. Like, what are you doing? Um, and also, when he talks about the offensive line, like Toronto Arms had said, this type of uh, offensive line, this type of move, or I think it might have been Connor Williams that was saying it, the zone running really does help the offensive line more because it forces the defense to move. And by forcing them to move, you can get them off their feet easier. So, Michael Dieter entering the final year of his contract. Obviously, he's, he's had pretty 
up and down career here in, in Miami. Do you feel like there's still development and upside for him? Yes, we do. Um, you know, Mike really developed as kind of a leader. You know, he became more, much more vocal. Um, you know, he had a an injury last year that was kind of a freak injury. You know, our doctors just said they hadn't really <laughs> seen anything like it when they were kind of, you know, going through that with him once he got hurt. Um, so he really hasn't played a ton of games at center still. Um, interesting thing about him is that every year, which is off season, we've had teams call, multiple teams call and offer us picks for him. So um, he's thought of pretty well around the league still as a player. Um, he knows there's still a developmental window for him to go, but um, he'll have competition at that spot as well. Find that very interesting. Again, these are things that we don't know, and I'm glad that he's talking about it. Uh, he's talking about uh, Dieter, essentially our center last year. It was a freak injury, like he said. Um, but the bringing up the fact that other teams are trying to trade for Dieter it's very interesting as well, but he said there will be an open competition for the center position, uh, so I expect them to buy a dress center. Uh, we'll see if that first pick in the third round, or if they make other moves to get more, for, you know, first or second round draft picks, uh, they take a center. But I found that very interesting. The, the Tyreek contract. Uh, what was the thinking? I mean, he's obviously the highest paid wide receiver now in league history. How did you come to the point where you were comfortable with that, that contract? I think it's like anything is as the other moves are being made around the league and you start seeing, you know, the structures and stuff of those con uh, contracts. But uh, at the end of the day, it was about adding the player, you know, um, he was such a unique talent. And for what, what Mike and I were talking about, what we needed on our offense for, you know, those dynamic catch and runs, obviously with Waddle, we added Cedric Wilson and then, you know, um, arguably Tyreek's the best one after catch receiver in the league. So. The opportunity to add to the offense for what he does and the skill set we were looking for, we couldn't pass on. And um, and obviously, you could do a deal like that is talking with ownership and Steve and Tom were, were, were fantastic in terms of uh, what we were looking for. And then, then Brandon did a great job of working working through with the agent to finish up the deal. What's your vision for returners? Who you see competing at that spot? And will you find a punter in the draft? Are you waiting for the draft to find a punter? Uh, you know, in terms of returner, um, we have multiple guys now. You know, Tyreek, first thing he said was, he goes, I want to make sure I'm back there getting a couple of returns every no. game. So um, we're fortunate with him, you know, Holland, Waddle. So we have guys that can do it. You know, they're all, you know, big contributors on their side of the ball as well. And, uh, and then we also have a couple guys, too, um, that can return. So we're not really worried about the return game, and we'll see how that all sorts out. Uh, I would say uh, punter, you know, we're still looking. There's a lot of veteran kickers out there, uh, like there always are. Um, and so we'll go through that process as well, the draft process. What was the thought process on the hype? Tagging uh, Mike Yasicki, and do you expect that he'll play on the tag as opposed to, you know, continued potential long-term contract discussions? Well, I think the one thing with Mike is that, you know, uh, at the end of the day, I think you saw a bunch of tight ends got just tagged, you know, uh, with that market. but. Mike's a, a good player, and our intentions are to keep good players. We don't like to let them go. Um, but Mike, he's a very competitive person, as you guys know, they've been around him. Um, he's going to play, you know, and we'll have some discussions with his agents at some point in the future. Uh, but I have no reservations that he's going to not play because he's too competitive, he's too good a person, he loves football. So, with the returner comment, uh, I, I said no to Tyreek Hill. Obviously, he's done it especially when it comes to, you know, certain situations like they do with Waddle. So I wouldn't not expect that to happen. Um, but I prefer it not. Same thing with Waddle. Same thing with Javon Holland. God forbid the injuries happen. Uh, but for the punter, I think we all know who we want in the draft. Rich, me and 11 picks in the top 100 the last couple of years, and now you have no picks in the top 100. Use those resources on Tyreek Hill. And a lot of those 11 players are some of your biggest producers. Does that kind of have a correlation to being to the ability to be so aggressive this time around and use those premium resources in the country like Tyreek Hill? Yeah, uh, it's, you know, like we talked about, we've been building here for the last few years. So um, the chance to get aggressive and add a, you know, a talented top player position was something we just felt was too good to pass up. Um, you know, as, as we we feel like good about the players we've drafted and but the great thing about all those guys are all very competitive and they know they can still get better and work and that's been exciting to watch those guys they've been all off season working and they pop by the office so um they're young guys that love football and they all want to keep working to get better chris is there any update um revisiting Xavier howard's contract do you have, do you have kind of a timeline for you'd like that to be addressed and 
maybe not a COVID, maybe a COVID would happen last uh, summer? Yeah, no, we've had conversations with um, Xavier and his agent. Um, we've had them a couple of weeks ago in person. Um, we'll keep those conversations to ourselves. We don't negotiate through the press, but um, hopefully we'll get to a, res a resolution sooner than later. You know, Xavier's done a lot of good things here for this organization. Um, I've known him for years. He was here when we drafted him. He was my second draft pick <laughs> here, and uh, so um, looking forward to him being here and, and helping us win. The Xavier Howard situation, right? Like you said, they're in constant talks and they're probably trying to come to an agreement because he probably wants to keep Xavier Howard here. You know, Byron Jones already took, you know, cleared up cap space by changing his uh, cap hit to a signing bonus. And I'm pretty sure they want to keep X here. That being said, and again, you guys know I'm the biggest Xavier Howard fan, uh, Stan. If they can't, I wouldn't be surprised if they trade him. Uh, whether during the draft or right before the draft, kind of like how they did the trade back, trade up last year, wouldn't be surprised if they trade him and try to get a second or a first. Um, might be able to get two seconds for Xavier Howard. You might be able to get a first and a second for Xavier Howard. That's it. I don't know. I'm not going to predict, but I would say probably minimum you could probably get, in my mind, it's probably a second. So all of a sudden the Dolphins have a second round pick again. To which team? I don't know. Look at a team that needs a corner and trade them. I don't know. A couple of final questions, guys. Going back to Travis's question with uh, the draft picks and such, three years have passed since you made the tons of deal. I don't think you could have imagined all the picks that have come from it or all the players that have come from it and how big of, a, how, how big of an impact that deal has had on your tenure in here. Um, I just, when you think back on Larry Tunzel and training away and everything that came back to it this year and how, uh, you know, what does it mean to you to kind of be able to well, I still remember the day we traded him. I was crying. <laughs> I was like, uh, we both were, you know, because uh, he, he's such a good guy. And, uh, you know, every once in a while he'll text me just like, hey, you know. Um, but he's, um, we made that trade. It was still, you know, you find a young franchise left tackle, you know, which everyone's looking for those. So, um, but in terms of the return, yeah, I never would have guessed that it would have led to all of this. And I still don't, you know, follow the whole in terms of what I think someone told me the other day, all the, you know what what we ended up acquiring based off of it but at the end of the day you just keep trying to do what's best you hope for the organization and what we feel good about you know in terms of um, trying to build a team that competes for Super Bowls here. So. Chris regarding I'm sorry to interrupt, regarding Tyree Kill can you describe the type of background work that the organization did relative to any off-field incidents that may have occurred in his past? Yeah, I think going forward, we feel good about it. We talked to a number of people who have been around Tyree, you know, especially in Kansas City the last few years. And um, so for us, we're comfortable moving forward. And, uh, and the expectation, like him, will be for every player in the roster to be, you know, a good teammate and good citizen and so forth. Chris, you're adding, uh, uh, obviously trading for Tyree and Simon yeah, we like having good players, you know, so I mean, we feel really good about that receiver room, you know, I think the expectation is, you know, he'll be here, but um, we always listen. As I've always said here to guys that know me, we always listen for all players on the roster. So. Yes, I have. Well, you guys, Final so question, guys. I wanted to ask you, you talked about being aggressive. This was a time for the player to be aggressive. Why, why do you think it's that time, or was it just the player? No, I, I think it's kind of what we talked about in Indy. You know, I, this was not a rebuild. You know, this was, you know, finding the right players, right pieces, right time. And I think we've, you know, acquired a lot of young talent coming in. But if you can find good veteran players that are good, not only good players, but leaders, you know, as well as, People talk about Tyreek's leadership there in Kansas City. You know, the Saints all raved. I mean, you hear Mickey Loomis stop me again. He's one of the best human beings you'll ever be around. So I think for our roster, if we can add, you know, however people, you know, blue players, as people call, you know, those top players at positions in the league, especially if they're great leaders and veterans, uh, for these guys, I think it's a great opportunity for us. So we just felt this was the right time to really be aggressive. He said a ton of good stuff um, in that interview, especially when it came to being aggressive, right? Because he even talked about the fact that um, they built through the draft, you know, getting in Phillips, uh, getting uh, Waddle, getting uh, 
Javon Holland, you know, the year before, you know, some people don't feel high on Tua, but you still bring in Tua. Austin Jackson still haven't seen what he can do. Um, Robert Hunt, Solomon Kinley, Brandon Jones, you know, they did really well those two years um, in the draft. You know, a lot of times you go into drafts hoping to bring out four starters, and the Dolphins last year brought three in the first round alone, a uh, first three picks alone the year before you have Tua you have Austin Jackson you have Robert Hunt you have Brandon Jones those are four starters right there so he did really well in free agency that he he was you know had the ability to go so aggressive this year but again they talk about Xavier Howard and they talk about Devontae Parker those seem like the two biggest trade candidates to potentially get some more picks back this year um we'll see we'll see how that pans out but other than that guys I hope you enjoyed this video um, with news breaks, like I said, you will get it. Uh, but other than that, I have a ton planned still. I've got to start doing my prospects. I think either tomorrow or on uh, Thursday, I'm going to start doing court breakdown quarterbacks. And we got running backs. Wipers. I'm doing every position. So other than that, guys, I'll see you in the next one. But like usual, stay classy. I fence up.